And then you see your display panels with these lights, you know, missile away, missile away, missile away. And I, and I got 10 of those things for the first time for me. That that was kind of like the eye opener. It's like, OK, this is real. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. Tim Lyon was an officer assigned to the 400th Strategic Missile Squadron located in Cheyenne, Wyoming. The squadron was responsible for 50 Peacekeeper intercontinental ballistic missiles based in underground silos in farmers' fields in remote areas of Wyoming. Tim was one of two launch officers who were responsible for 10 of these missiles. He and his colleague would descend 40 to 60 feet below ground to a concrete capsule which housed the launch control centre. There, he would spend 24-hour alerts ready to launch 100 nuclear warheads, each with 20 times the explosive force of the Hiroshima bomb at speeds of up to 15,000 miles per hour. We hear in detail about his training, the testing procedures, security, and how he handled such a huge responsibility. Tim also describes launching one of these missiles from a test site in the U.S., Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hello there, my name is Mark Franks and I served in the Royal Air Force from 1982 through to 2007. What I find fascinating about Cold War Conversations are the stories and opinions of those that lived the other side of the Iron Curtain over that period. It's truly fascinating to listen to and keep up the good work and all that you do at Cold War Conversations. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Tim Lyon to our Cold War Conversation. Just before we start, uh, I want to mention we had a slight problem with Tim's microphone, so you may hear some crackle and a little bit of distortion, but I hope that doesn't affect your enjoyment of the episode. Thank you. Ever since I was a young child, I, I, maybe going back to when I was five years of age, if I can remember right, uh, my next door neighbor was a former fighter pilot in World War II. Matter of fact, he flew P-38s. And he was one of the greatest human beings I ever met. He was an amazing man. He was wonderful. He was great to me. Um, good role model, good friend. You know, my parents and, him, and he and his wife, uh, you know, were just very close as were our families. So for me, that's where it started. I said, okay, this man is so, you know, I'm impressed with him. An officer in the Air Force, maybe this is something that I want to endeavor to do someday. And, and I always kept it in the back of my mind. So I never knew how long I was going to serve, but I knew for a fact I was going to serve in the Air Force in some capacity. Now, what I wanted to do was emulate him and become a pilot and fly. Um, however, the plans got derailed, you know, once I got up in age and, uh, and the eyes went bad. So, you know, at that time, I couldn't even get a waiver to be a a navigator, um, you know, the vision was so bad. So I knew that that dream, my dream of actually being a pilot in the air force like that, in that capacity, it was over. So I had to go to plan B like, okay, what do I want to do? I know I still want to serve. I I have no doubts about that. I'm going to do that, but what am I going to do? I began thinking about it, doing a little bit of research, uh, you know, kind of came across some of the, you know, ICBM stuff, which I, I'd known some of that before, but I didn't know anything. I mean, no great detail, mind you, just investigated it. And then I decided um, based on, you know, the locations where those things were, were intriguing to me, but also they, you know, give you a free master's degree. And I think, well, that's, that's pretty interesting too you get to a point and, and they do give you a choice. Once you've narrowed it down and you had said, and they, you know, accepted you, that this is your career path. You're going to be in ICBMs. Well, we don't have a whole lot of those bases everywhere. So you kind of look around and kind of get to choose and, you know, you make a top three list, which I did and ended up kind of trying one. How does the induction program work? 
the, the, mo the most common program to get commissioned in any of the services here, most of the officers are commissioned out of universities through that type of a program. And, uh, you know, anybody can, can choose to join the, the, the Air Force or, or whatever other um, service branch. You go to university, get your degree, and then after that, you know, you go on contract, receive your commission, and, and off you go in your, in your chosen career, career path. So is there basic training, you know, square bashing and the, the stuff that you would expect? No, I mean, it's very, very modified. Normally we think uh, when people say basic training, I, you know, heck, I even think about it. Um, that's that's not a cakewalk. I mean, that's, that's a tough affair. But we do have a little summer program that we go off and we do some very, you know, minor basic things. But as officers, once you get the commission, there is no, you know, basic training, um, unlike the enlisted folks go through. So it's, it's relatively straightforward, not, uh, not, not a high level of difficulty, to be honest with you. What year was this that you're, you're joining up? So for me, it's the, the tail end of the 80s. Matter of fact, I, I still remember when all that dust up was happening over in Eastern Europe, uh, actually the Berlin Wall and all that stuff. I had not actually started my active duty day at that moment, but I was on my way. I mean, I was right around the corner. So that's kind of my introduction into the environment that we were in. It was, uh, you know, that period of uh, the tail end of the Cold War. I call it the transitional period. And then I stayed, uh, let's say I would have departed in, it would have been the fall. I think September of 97 is when I officially left. You know, when you were looking at the Berlin Wall falling and all those countries uh, throwing off the sort of shackles of communism, did you think at some point, Oh, actually, I might not have much of a job here. Well, yeah, I mean, the initial reaction, I thought, well, which was good, to be honest. I, I thought, hmm, OK, we're finally going to be moving in a in a good direction. And I think instead of, you know, keeping things so, so hot and the tension so high that things would cool and thaw and we would start to eliminate and reduce. And um, those were my thoughts. And so, yes, I actually had some thoughts like, well, I don't know how I'm going to stay in, but I might find myself a couple of years down the road with nothing to do. Yeah, this might not have been the best career move at that point in your history. But anyway, you were you were there till till 97. So what what did the training consist of? I mean, how how do they start training a a missile ear? What what happens? Yeah, generally speaking, you know, you come out of university like we did and uh, you get your degree, you get your commission. And then we have a uh, we call it the schoolhouse, but all that particular training in that, you know, in the ICBM business at the time, it was all done at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It's a crash course over several months, and it's it's pretty intense in, in, in the fact that they are throwing a, a lot of volume at you in a very short period of time. So you're 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 drinking from a fire hose uh, and trying to absorb all this uh, information, uh, technology programs, procedures, uh, you name it. So it is, it's pretty intense. And, uh, you know, we start early and we, we kind of went late, uh, full days. But, you know, we were allowed to have, a, you know, we did have some downtime and some stuff where we could get out and uh, do a few things, uh, go for a hike, walk, jog, um, hobbies, w w you know, what have you. So it's not like we were locked down in some facility and, you know, you can't get out of there until the training's over. Um, but that's just what I remember about it, being being intense because there was so much information that you had to absorb in a very short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And how soon in the training did they actually take you inside a command center just so you got a feel as to what your actually workspace was going to be like? Uh, as I recall, I mean, it was pretty, pretty soon. Uh, um, you know, Vandenberg is also a very functioning um, facility. Uh, you know, they still do it to this day. When, when we have these tests, we, we test an ICBM. Well, we take it up out of the ground, whether it be North, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, or where have you. And we send it out to Vandenberg and we assemble it and we test launch. So you have those sites, those facilities are there where you can literally see them in a matter of a few minutes. Um, uh, they're right there on the base. So, yes. So you got to see it, you know, in the first time you, you see that. And we also have simulator that looks identical to the launch control center on the base. And you're in there uh, quite often as well. Yeah. You first see it. And I think for me, that's when it started to, the wheels started turning like, you know, what have I gotten myself into? Um, this is, 
this may be a little more than I imagined or, or envisioned, uh, not in a bad way, just kind of, wow, you know, this is it. And, and holy cow, this stuff, uh, this has been going on for decades and decades when those people, you know, they're, they're sitting in those seats 24 hours a day, seven days a week without no breaks for Thanksgiving, no Christmas, nothing. Essentially, you're, you're responsible for the most powerful weapons in the country's inventory. And that must be a very sobering thought. And when you step into that center, you actually see the tools that would potentially launch them. Sobering is a great word. <laughs> yeah, it's sobering. Uh huh. Were you vetted in any way before you joined to check about, for example, your political sympathies or anything like that? Uh, definitely. Um, there is a, a vetting process. And like I mentioned before, you know, I actually thought we would have to do some kind of like serious in-depth psychological screening, counseling or something. There was nothing to that effect. Um, what did happen was, you know, as, as you're, you can well imagine when you're talking about nuclear weapons, they, they want to know who you are. Um, so there's an extensive background check. And I mean, I, I can't remember all the things that we had to write down on paper and, and divulge, but it was basically your life, uh, every place you lived, the, the schools you went to and, and name names, name names of people that you knew in your past. And that, that was kind of a funny part of, of this whole process. But, you know, these people, they work for the Department of Defense. They would take that information and literally go out and they would they would find these people. That, that you have jotted down and they would um, have interviews with them and, and ask them questions about, you know, you. And so you never know who was going to get seen or who, who was going to get called or any of that. So, so sometimes it was funny when the phone rang out of the blue and I would pick it up <laughs> and be somebody, you know, I hadn't seen them in 15, 20 years. Well, hey, look, I don't know what's going on, but there's some people in, in the suits and they got the badges and they came here and they were asking me all kinds of questions about you. Um, I didn't know what to tell them. I said, oh, I hope you just told them the truth. I mean, just whatever it was, just, and they, yeah, we did. And I said, no problem. They probably thought you'd applied for a job in the CIA or something like that. Eh? I mean, when they first get that contact, hey, we need to come talk to you about the, this fellow. And uh, my name is a Agent So-and-So with the Department of Defense. You're probably thinking, oh, my gosh, what is going on here? Yeah, yeah. The the missile systems that are being operated at this time are Minuteman, Titan, and a new system, which you're going to be working on. Yeah. So even before I pulled my first uh, alert, they, they had just gotten rid of, and I think it was uh, maybe in, in late 1987, the last Titan II was taken off alert. And I think that was the one in Judsonia, Arkansas. So that was already gone by the time I was active duty. So once uh, once I got to the active duty role, the only thing we had in land based at the time was the Minuteman three, the one that I was involved with, which was the Peacekeeper. And some people also know it as a, the MX missile. What was the difference between the Peacekeeper and the previous systems? I'm presuming it was an improvement on them. Absolutely right. It was uh, an incredible improvement. The technology that went into the Peacekeeper, it was pretty stunning. Um, a lot of money, a lot of R and D uh, was poured into that program, and you know, out comes this this ICBM we call Peacekeeper. Some call it the MX. Um, amazing piece of technology works incredibly well. The main differences are it, it's, a, it's a cold launch system. So where the Minuteman three is is we hot fired, you know, out of that silo, out of the ground, engine ignition happens in, in the ground. Um, the Peacekeepers actually ejected out of that silo. And then once it reaches a little certain altitude, obviously it triggers the ignition of the uh, the rocket motor and then it's off. The other main differences are in the amount of ordnance that you can place on it. So with the Minuteman 3, obviously three warheads um, on top of that one versus the Peacekeeper where we carried 10, 10, 10 warheads on one individual missile. And, and those are some of the main differences. From what I remember with uh, Peacekeeper, it, it was also originally designed to be mobile in some way. Like there was a, a plan to launch it from trains, I think. 
That's absolutely right. So, you know, in the early stages of, of R&D and, and planning and theorizing, um, they looked at a rail garrison mode, just just like you mentioned. Um, they even also looked at a, a method whereby you can put it on this uh, kind of a massive truck and haul it behind the truck, which is highly mobile. Uh, you know, could basically go anywhere, um, find a place to park and, you know, erect and then, and then fire. But none of us uh, were ever approved. Um, they never made congressional approval, nor were they funded, to my knowledge. So the only thing we ended up with was just the land-based option. Which was using existing silos. It, it was uh, actually old Minuteman 3, and um, it, which was another interesting part of it. You, you think about all this amazing technology and this money and the newness, you know, the cutting edge of the Peacekeeper ICBM. And then when you go out there to the, you know, launch control center or the, uh, the LF or, or the silo, people know that silo where you actually place the missile. Well, it's just existing old memory technology. So there's a little bit of a big disparity between the uh, level of technology between the two. So it was, it was interesting, but you know, it cost effective and it, and it worked. Let, let's just describe how the the setup for this works because we we talked about a command control center, which is where the launches are triggered from. But you talk about other silos around. So in your role, you're in the command center, and there's missile silos in a radius around from you. That is correct. So we are centralized basically in that launch control location. And each ICBM, you know, it, anywhere from three miles, maybe to 10 miles in, in distance from the launch control center, uh, scattered around in, in a circular radius. So it, the piece can also being different, you know, there was only five locations, five sites that operated Peacekeeper ICBMs. And it was part of the 400 uh, Strategic Missile Squadron. And those sites, you know, we use the phonetic alphabet. So that would have been uh, Papa, Quebec, uh, Romeo, Sierra, and Tango. So P, Q, R, S, and T. So five launch control centers that monitored or dealt with or controlled uh, 10 missiles per. And, you know, everything is interconnected. So, but if one of those sites becomes inoperable, it's not a problem. You, you've got four sites that can actually pick up those 10 missiles and, and, and control them. It's it just like, okay, in the event that we do have a problem in one, that's not a problem. We can still launch those 10 missiles. Uh, we'll just pass the responsibility on to another site. And, uh, you know, even one that we had, which was T or Tango, uh, outside of Wheatland, Wyoming, it, it actually was the uh, site that was the alternate command post. And, you know, from Tango, uh, alternate command post, we could actually, you know, you could have command and control of, of pretty much all, all the other ones. The way the stuff worked, um, it was just incredible. It, people had the foresight and forethought to, you know, create them that way, that in the event of, pro of a problem over here, that's fine. We, we can deal with that because we have so much inter interconnectivity and so forth. So in your command center, you are responsible for how many missiles 10 10 and on each of those missiles there's 10 warheads so you're responsible for 100 nuclear warheads and what sort of power do each of those warheads have or what is what is the maximum power they can have because presumably their megatonnage or kilotonnage can be varied yeah, this is a pretty interesting um, point here too. So each missile had ten. That's correct, and each one of those it was an it was an Avco Mark Twenty One reentry vehicle. Now the warhead on it was uh, boy, now his memory's going to have to serve me right on this one. Um, I think it was a W eighty seven warhead that was approximately three hundred kilotons per one single warhead. Okay, now. And I think there was a modernization program at some point, and and I don't know for a fact, but whether it was before I got there, or maybe after, I don't remember. But I think I don't know if it was all of them, but but a modernization program that even took the kilotonnage up to almost uh, 360 kilotons per. So if we do the math just on the basics, one ICBM that's going to be about 3.6 megatons per flight. 
of 10 missiles. So, you know, if, if you're up there in, uh, let's, let's call it Quebec, and you've got your 10 missiles, all 10 of those, you combine that, that's approximately 36 megatons. The squadron as a whole, when you pile all that together, it's roughly 180 megatons. And for most people, for most people, their only reference point that they have is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What we're talking about that is, I can't remember the exact number, but maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 kilotons. I just looked it up. It's 20 for Hiroshima because I was I wanted to have some sort of measure there. So Hiroshima is minute compared to the firepower that you that even you in just one command center have got. Yeah. And, and then the other part of that is those were nuclear devices. OK, what we're dealing with are thermonuclear devices that just nasty, nasty stuff. To say the least, to say the least. So in your command center. So I just want to describe what the command center is. So there's a surface building. Which has. Uh, sleeping accommodation and some sort of staffing there that provides food for the the crew. Yeah, that's right. We call it the MAF or the missile facility, and it it looks like a, just a single story ranch style house just stuck out in the middle, you know, Farmer Joe's field or something to that effect. Of course, it is surrounded by barbed wire, but and chain link fencing, but. Yeah, once you get inside the building, that's where we house um, the support personnel. Um, so we had a, a facility manager. Um, we had security people, obviously, and had a couple of bunk rooms where, where, where they would sleep. And we also had a cook at, you know, on call for us that would provide our meals and such. And, uh, you know, the security people stayed at that facility and they were, we called it, you know, they stayed up. And, of course, we were down there in the launch control center below them. And their main job is to secure that facility and not allow anybody that was not authorized on that site. And um, and they mean business. I mean, they, they would take care of business for sure. Very well armed. I can imagine. The actual command center that you operate from is something like 60 feet underground. How is that accessed? That's a good approximation on the depth. Um, and you access it um, up top and you have a, a very secure door. And, of course, you have to pass off uh, codes to the crew that's down there. And if the code is right, everything's OK, then the security personnel upstairs can open the open the door. You hop on a service elevator. And this, this to me was almost funny. But, you know, these service elevators, my gosh, we're talking about made in mid to late 60s. So they're old, old as dirt uh, and slow as dirt. But, you know, uh, you get on that service elevator and down you go. And then when you come out of the service elevator, you have one big blast door in front of you. And we call it a blast door. It's incredibly thick, uh, concrete rebar. Uh, got to hide, you know, these pins that, that you can slide into the wall to help secure, you know. So that's one blast door. When you come into through that blast door, you come into the place we call the tunnel junction. So off to your left would be the equipment building. And that's where the emergency diesel generator is and other equipment. And then to the right, you, you look there and there's another blast door. And that's the blast door that gets into the launch control center. And usually that's a location where, you know, I sent you some of those pictures. You see some of this artwork. <laughs> I got some creative people, you know, put the artwork in there. And they, that's usually where it is. But um, the crew inside, hydraulically operated, they, you know, pump those pins in. They open that door. And then that's when you can step into the launch control center, which is, uh, you know, almost like a capsule type shape. And it's suspended on basically like shock absorbers. And they were, anyway, had these air containers and air pressure, and you had to monitor them. And if the floor got unleveled, you'd have to start playing with that. And sometimes that would get comical, you know, but um, just make sure the thing was level. Every every day, you just check the level of the, uh, the launch control center inside there because it was suspended uh, for good measure just to, um, I guess, have the additional capacity to resist uh, in any kind of shock waves, blast pressures, and, and so forth. And it's you and your launch control commander in there, and that's it. Yeah, just the two of us, two people. So two person crews, twenty four hours a day, um, and you would run a yeah twenty four hour shift. And the next day, somebody would come in to relieve you. And then while you were in there, 
you know, in that 24 hour period, you break up different tasks that you, you know, the checklist you have to follow. You would inspect equipment every time, you know, you'd run through different checklists, make sure everything is working appropriately. Everything is set right. Everything is in order. Take the classified documents. And that's a trade off. Every time you have an alert, you know, you, you, you are literally passing the classified material to the next crew. So inventory every single piece of that before you have a changeover and you sign your name on the, on that piece of paper that says, Hey, I've, I've got control of this stuff now. And then, you know, go home and then you sit there in, in 24 hours, you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes it was so gosh awful quiet and boring. <laughs> and then there were times when there would be so much going on, whether it would be actual real time tests happening uh, a lot of maintenance activity or, or some security issues going off. Sometimes the phones and the, and the tasks can, you'd be spinning pretty fast. So you never knew. And, you know, how do, how do you pass the time? And one of the ways I, I mentioned before, they give us the opportunity to get a master's degree. So, you know, take your books out there and, and flip them open and start studying, doing some master work. Also, they would, you know, they ship books out to those sites. I don't know if it was once a month. I can't remember, but I mean, just almost had their own individual libraries tons of books. So you pick a book up and read it, you know, that sort of thing. And then, and you have to divide your sleep shifts up, you know, um, but two people can't have a go at it for 24 hours straight. So you break your sleep shifts up as you obviously aware one person has to remain awake at all times. And that's, uh, that's policy. And, and that was the law, you know? So both of you couldn't to snooze at the same time and <laughs> be in big trouble. Were you both armed? No, and this is this another funny story to me because when we came on active duty at that time, those sidearms had been taken away from missile crews. Now, I, I heard various stories of why it happened. Uh, one of the funniest ones, um, which don't know it to be true, now I believe it is, but one individual, and I don't remember what base or what site, um, he was kind of toying around with the old sidearm. And, you know, had one of those oopsies and, you know, discharged around into some of that equipment. And I mean, we're talking about exp this stuff, you know, I don't know if that was like the nail in the coffin or, or what, but um, we were not armed. Now, personally, I, I didn't know why we weren't. I wanted to be. And, uh, you know, just in case, I don't know. I mean, you can think of a myriad of things that might happen or could happen if you're accosted at some point. You got some classified materials with you or, or who knows, but um, I would have loved to have been armed just to defend myself between the base and the site. But that's just the way it was. Did part of your training cover sort of what to do if there was an intruder or some breach of the command post? Yeah, you better believe it. So um, we had incredible security procedures and there would be a variety of different ways. We knew that something nefarious was going on above us and boy, we could lock that thing down. And, you know, you, you put those pins in that blast door, there's nobody's getting to you or if they do, it's going to take an awful long time. And then we can even, um, you know, if you have nefarious characters upstairs and they decided they want to, you know, do some uh, nasty chemicals or, or biological agents and like that, we even had the ability to shut ourselves off in the air supply for a period of time. And we could even generate our own oxygen within that launch control center again for a period of time, but it hopefully enough so that things got sorted out and, and returned to normal, but um, tons of, of procedures uh, about security. Presumably similarly, if you had a situation like a fire down, down there was, was there another means of you exiting? Yeah, I mean, we, we could, but what we, this is one that, um, this was a big one, Ian, I'm glad you bring this up because, and it, and it, it very rarely ever happened. I think I only, heard, my whole seven years, I think I heard of it happening, whether it, it, minimum three or peacekeeper squadrons at, at FU Warren, I think maybe once, but as you can imagine, if you're sitting in there and you've got those pins, you know, in, in the wall and that the, the blast doors closed, you're kind of locked in there pretty good. So yeah, fire was a big concern. So it was just drilled into us. And even to this day, you know, I still remember uh, like some of the procedures. Uh, I remember the checklist, you know, we had it tabbed a certain way. Uh, everybody knew about emergency power and air, EPAP. You better 
you have that one in the in the back of your mind and be ready to go at a moment's notice because if something happened, we knew that we better we had to get on that problem fast. Uh, if we didn't, then we could have been in a uh, a pickle. But as far as egress, now there was another method to to the egress. But as far as like this emergency power air fire problem, our best bet was to tackle that problem and or get out of that blast tour as fast as we possibly could. Now, the other means of egress, but this one, it's not even feasible in a situation because it would take too long. We do have, um, and it was up above the commander's console on the outside, and we called it the emergency escape patch. So you would have to go out there and open that up, and it would fall. And I think it had a certain amount of sand in it or something like that. Some of the sand would fall in. And I think you would actually have to, and I don't know how many feet it would have been, but, but dig your way out through some soil before you got, you know, to fresh air um, on top. Dig your way out. Yes. Whoa. Did you ever have to practice that? N- no. Mm-mm. I mean, we there was a checklist for it, but it was like nobody, we never, ever, ever did anything like that. Uh, what, what, was there a shovel attached to it to help you with that? As I recall, I think there was a digging tool or something to that effect um, right there in close proximity. And, you know, that one was that was kind of the one that was like, uh, if we're using this, then we know for a fact things have gotten gosh awful bad uh, above us, you know, because it's our only way. Again, it's our emergency escape route, like last ditch effort to get out of there. Because you're you're 60 feet underground so you're not digging through 60 feet of earth there's just some no. earth there that you've got to clear before you can use that exit and then you've got to climb up another i don't know 40 50 feet or something like that i guess yeah and, I, and, I, and again i cannot remember the exact um length uh, of that tube but um yeah but and that's the way it was i mean that was just part of it and uh, interesting piece well well, when you were having your training, I'm presuming you were trained by people who had worked in this business for, for quite some time. That is absolutely correct. And uh, an interesting story here is when I got to Vandenberg. Now, of course, at the time, I, I had no idea who this man was. I'd never met him in my life. His name is Rodney Holder. Um As it turns out, and I didn't know this until years later, okay? He never told me about it. I never heard anybody buzzing about that um, on the base. But Rodney Holder was one of the officers that was on duty in Damascus, Arkansas. And I think it was in September of 1980, I believe, when they had that uh, horrific accident there in the, the explosion, you know, blowing that warhead out of there, and uh, it was a, it was a gosh awful thing. But that was interesting. I mean, that guy was my instructor, and, and he was good. He was he was really good at what he what he did. Can you explain just a, a layman's view of what that actual Damascus incident was and what happened? You know, the, the thing in about nuclear weapons is we always hope and we expect for things to work perfectly, to go right all the time. But the fact of the matter is, that's not the case. Um, you probably extremely aware of some of these accidents and incidents that have happened over time. But basically, in a nutshell, in Damascus, I think it was two-man maintenance team out there doing a pressure check or, or maybe checking the pressure in the stage two oxidizer tank. And at the time, part of the press was you were using a socket. This The socket on that thing was I don't know, six to eight pounds. So it's a big piece of equipment. And then you have the ratchet. That thing was like two to three feet long. You get right there next to the missile, you know, and you got these little rubber skirts around there. So if anything drops, it's supposed to catch it. I mean, so this is when the odds started going crazy, like million to one odds or more. Um, The socket, lose control of it. It goes right betwixt these rubber skirts, falls down, hits the thrust mount at the bottom, ricochets into the missile, and, and it begins a leak. And, uh, you know, that's where the craziness kind of really started. And uh, it went on for hours and hours and hours and hours and men reaching out to contractors and, you know, figuring out what, what to do, you know, how to solve the problem. And eventually, and I think to this day, I, I could be wrong. I think to this day, 
I, I don't know that they ever found out exactly what caused the explosion. Um, but you know, back then with the Titan, you're talking about liquid propellants and that they're hypergolics. So all you have to do is get them in, in contact and you get an explosion, um, ignition, uh, uh, what have you. I mean, very dangerous, dangerous stuff that those people worked on back then. Here's what happened about 10 hours after the dropping of that tool into the silo. Early in the morning of Friday, September the 19th, 1980, a two-man investigation team consisting of Senior M and David Lee Livingston and Sergeant Jeff K. Kennedy entered the silo. Because the Weber detectors indicated an explosive atmosphere, the two were ordered to evacuate, and the team was then ordered to re-enter the silo to turn on an exhaust fan. Livingston re-entered the silo to carry out the order and shortly thereafter, at about 3am, the fuel exploded, likely due to the arcing of the exhaust fan. The initial explosion catapulted the 740-tonne silo door away from the silo and ejected the second stage and warhead. Once clear of the silo, the second stage exploded and the thermonuclear warhead landed about 100 feet from the launch complex's entry gate. Its safety features prevented any loss of radioactive material or nuclear detonation. Livingston died at the hospital and 21 others in the immediate vicinity of the blast sustained various injuries. Kennedy struggled with respiratory issues from inhaling oxidizer but survived. Livingston was posthumously promoted to staff sergeant. The entire missile launch complex was destroyed. The launch complex was never repaired and the site is now buried under a mound of gravel, soil and small concrete debris. And here, here's where it gets crazy. At the time of this, I mean, this is the largest warhead that this country has ever placed on an ICBM. It was nine megatons, almost 10 megatons. If something had happened, I mean, my goodness, me, again, we're talking about a thermonuclear device. A lot of Arkansas would have been absolutely devastated. We think that sometimes we have things under control, and, and yet we have proven time and time again that we just don't. And so sometimes things just happen, and we have no expectation of it. Uh, we haven't planned for it. We haven't trained for it. Never would have envisioned you know, something of that magnitude happening. How were the remote silos patrolled or secured? Were, were there people out at each of these silos, or, or were they unmanned? Mm -mm, totally unmanned, which is interesting. So if you know what you're looking for and you're driving that part of the country, you can just look off in, uh, you know, again, Farmer, Farmer Joe's field and you'll see one of them, a very nondescript looking thing. It's just it's got some chain link fence around it with a little barbed wire, and, you know, a sign on the front, little access road and, you know, a pole or two sticking up. And that's about it. So the way they provided security was when we're sitting there on alert 60 feet underground in the launch control center. We are connected to that missile. We also have an alarm system. So it motion sensitive. So anything that gets on that facility that's moving, it triggers an alarm. And when the alarm goes off, that's when you, you know, you, you go into, go into action. You've got a checklist. You call basically you call upstairs. You tell them you have an alarm out at uh, so-and-so site. Security manager upstairs, he gets gets the guys together, lets him know, and they saddle up. Um, they put on the gear, the garb, um, weapons out, lock and load, and off they go to inspect. And this is what, you know, I always felt bad for those guys because it didn't matter what the conditions were outside. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. They were firing the trucks up, and they were going to investigate. If it was 17 degrees below zero, with a you know 35 Fahrenheit but wind chill and snow blowing sideways didn't matter they're going um, they had a tough job especially when it came to that kind of stuff and sometimes you would sit there and not, you'd feel bad for them but then you would get very frustrated on their behalf because anytime the alarm goes off they have to go so they could literally be you know back at the missile alert facility above me undoing all the gear in the garb and, and well saddle up gotta go again and they were young some of these guys were very very young uh, i think some of them were just out of high school you know on, on the enlisted side and, um but but good guys you know really good guys upstairs 
I guess uh, some of these things were like animals and stuff like that. Was that what was triggering them? A lot of times, you know, it could be a, a, a rabbit or some kind of animal. Yeah. Um, maybe a certain weather, you know, issues and, and so forth. But that's how they uh, provide the security. I mean, I, I remember when I first found that out, I always thought, well, God, that is strange. I, I would have thought for sure they have people here 24-7, but no. Cheaper that way, probably. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So back in the uh, the missile command post, how often are you doing sort of like tests and, you know, practice run-throughs of, of the launch? When you're on alert, active duty alert, um, there is no test practice of a launch. Uh, we, we do all that back on the base and simulator. However, on a very rare occasion, we would do some additional tests. And again, I, I repeat, this is, this was pretty rare, but every now and then we would have an airborne launch control system. It, the aircraft was an EC-135. It, it was called looking glass, but they did have the ability or the capacity, you know, from an airborne platform to connect with us on the ground to help us facilitate launches. And interestingly enough, one of my old classmates at Texas A&M, Pat Thomason, um, used to fly missions. And unbeknownst to us at the time, there could have been on a very rare occasion where he was actually overflying uh, one of my locations in this test. And we just didn't know that the other uh, happened to be on alert that particular day. And so even that was another method whereby if things were going south, at least we had the capability with this airborne crew to send the signals down to these missiles to, to you know, to affect what didn't do that very often. I mean, it was very rare, but um, every now and then we would have something like that. But there was never any of this um, kind of like, hey, let's let's run a test and, and see if the guys are ready to do a launch while they're you know on alert. I mean, I'm sure one of the uh, the questions that people would be, what was the food like there? Were your cooks good? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, these guys, um, they only had so much to work with, okay? <laughs> and when I say that, I'm talking about the food, the food choices, even the food quality. But most of them did a really good job of, of taking their own personal flair to it, you know, uh, making it a little extra special or different, something like that. But it's kind of a just basic fare. I mean, you know, hamburgers, hot dogs. Uh, macaroni and cheese, tater tots. Uh, sometimes we would have maybe chicken or steak, salads, that sort of thing. Um, vegetables, you know, and it, you always had a menu down there and you would fill out the menu. I guess it, I think we did it in advance. So it would give him the ability to uh, be ready to go at any time and he could create something for you. And usually there was a schedule, but um yeah, we would we would get our meals, and he would he literally bring them for himself. It's almost a la carte. It's almost like a hotel. Well, not quite. Absolutely. But... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Brilliant, brilliant. And could you contact your family at all while you were there when you were on alert, or or not? Was it you had to you were basically sealed off for them for twenty four hours? Yeah. Again, this was one of the interesting things for me when I when I first uh, started doing it. My expectation was that when I got out there, that launch control center, that I was going to be locked away from society and no connection whatsoever. But it wasn't the case. I mean, you could pick the phone up. And of course, you can imagine we're talking about 60s technology. It's the old rotary dial phone, you know, put your finger in there and, you know, that sort of thing. But you could pick it up and we had landlines. You could call back to your house, talk to your um, friends, family, colleagues, wives, spouses, kids. Uh, you, you call anybody, um, anywhere, which was just interesting to me, but it was also part of, you know, you learned how to do that and, and be secure with it. So any, anytime anything happened, you'd have to be cognizant that there was an open line and you'd have to, you know, make sure that everybody knew that there was an open and then you'd have to shut the line off, uh, and, and take care of business or, or have a conversation and, and then you can get back to your, your, your call. And the other thing is, we also had the connectivity with every other ICBM site. We had the capacity if we wanted to, to reach out. And I, the guys over in North Dakota, if I wanted to, I could call them on the phone or heck, I can send them a message uh, on one of our devices inside that launch control center. We could communicate that way. Because you just don't imagine that you've got that closeness. Could they, could your family call you or not? Yes. They could. 
Yes. And it was just hard to imagine, but the phone would ring and, you know, your partner picks it up and goes, Hey, it's your, uh, it's your best friend online too. You know? Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. You don't, you don't imagine it. So you, we were talking about launch tests and you said you had to go to Vandenberg or other places to, to actually go through the, the full procedure. What was that like actually going through that and what's going through your head when you're doing that yeah i think this is a good one because you know you're talking about a job or a business that you're you're hoping you know you're hoping and praying you never have to do because you know what you got at your fingertips um and i think it's different for for a lot of people but uh, i think some people are really similar in the like the first time you do it <laughs> like this realization um just kind of hits you when when you go through all these procedures and you put those keys in that console and, and the two of you you coordinated and you you know you turn the keys and off they go and then you see your display panels with these lights you know missile away missile away missile away and I man I got ten of those things on where they're supposed to go and what, what's about to happen so for the first time for me that that was kind of like the eye opener it's like okay this is real um, <laughs> this is uh, serious business here and uh, you know. The level of uh, responsibility kind of over overcomes you, or, or you come to the realization just again what you have at your disposal. Um, maybe sometimes the stress, anxiety, pressure, um, feelings of just unbelievable responsibility. Like we have to do this right. We have to. We cannot make a mistake. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, when, when we were talking sort of offline. You know, we we were talking about your your Christian beliefs, and uh, did you struggle to reconcile those versus the job that you were doing, and effectively you were going to be killing millions if those keys were turned? Um, yes, I did struggle with it, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, it never was to the point ever where I thought I. I I can't do this job, but it was always with me, you know, even hoping and praying that I would never, ever, ever have to do this. Um, there were different times when I would think about it more than others, um, but it, that feeling never left me. Uh, it was just a very difficult thing to understand that I'm sitting there, you know, a part of this. And and if it's done, you kind of do the math in your head, like you said, like, oh my God, you know, how many millions is that? And yeah, a couple of times I'd, I'd play with it and I'm like, hmm, man, 25, 55 million. I mean, depending, depending on the locations and the breaks, I mean, and it just kind of hits you right in the craw and it's tough. Sometimes it's just tough when, when you start thinking about that. Um, but like I, like I said before, with me personally, it was never to point or I had to like raise my hand and say, man, I, I, I just can't do it. I would have done it in, but I'm telling you with a, with a great level of trepidation. Um, but boy, believe you me, I, I've done it. Appreciate you um, going, going through that with us there. At some point you got the opportunity to actually do a real launch. Mm -hmm. Just, just talk us through that. It is different because this is part of a test. Um, and so what we did was we, we took one of those uh, Peacekeeper ICBMs out of the ground, shipped it by rail car out to California, reassembled it. And we had three launchers, so myself and my partner, and then two other crews of two. And then we had a maintenance team that went out. And so all the maintenance guys, of course, they, they preceded us uh, to Vandenberg. They got there and they were putting the missile in and, you know, it, attaching everything and doing tests and making sure everything is just in there the way it's supposed to be every gun bolt. Um, we come in behind them and we're there for a little bit. And then we start going out to the launch control center. And on, on the day that we launch it, and again, this is part of a follow on test and evaluation program. And, and the, the theory is you, you just test everything as best you can to make sure that every single part of that works exactly like it's supposed to work. And if there are any hiccups or glitches, hey, that's when you sort it out. And so a normal launch sequence is just you and your partner 
going through your, you know, your classified procedures and putting the keys in the console and turning. So in the launch, this, this launch, we do it in stages. So the first crew is actually installing targeting data. All right. The second crew is the one that puts in the first key turn that sends the sequence there. And then the, you have a third crew that comes in for the final key turn that sends the missile on its way. And uh, fortunately for me, I was, I was the, the, the middle part of that puzzle, the first key turn. So I had just enough time to get upstairs and get on top of this building. And the actual silo where it came out of the ground, it, it really, in the big scheme of things, it was not that far from where we were. So you're sitting there and it was at night. So it made, it made it more spectacular to me. And this thing comes, you know, out of the ground and you see the steam gas, you know, billowing. And then all of a sudden that rocket motor ignites. And I mean, you, you, you feel it, <laughs> you feel it, you hear it. And it's like rattling your teeth. Um, I mean, the power of this thing and it's talking about a relatively small rocket motor. Um, the, the peacekeeper was roughly 70 feet tall. And I think, um, had the capacity to deliver like 220, 230,000 pounds of thrust. It is insignificant compared to something like the Saturn. But however, when you're that close to one of those things, boy, you just, you feel the power of that thing. And it doesn't take it long. Once that thing gets moving and it generates, yeah, and next thing you know, it's it's gone. I mean, it's literally, it feels like an earthquake when it's going off and you're that close. Yeah, I mean, you you literally can feel things vibrating, and it's uh, it's impressive, you know. And for for I mean, look, young guys like us out of college, you talk about something that was just incredible to do, and and it, I'll be honest with you, it was fun. It was incredibly fun, and then we had a chance to even see, you know, after the fact, they would bring us in and kind of we had to go classified area, but you, you have an opportunity the first time to to literally see in real time. I mean, how things actually work. And you think, my gosh, we, we have got some incredibly bright people that created, you know, the, the hardware, the software, everything that can deliver this thing from Vandenberg Air Force Base, out place called the Kwajalein Atoll, with the accuracy that, that they achieve. And it, it is incredible. And trust me, that thing, it works. It, it was unbelievably effective. Yeah, I think I've seen a photo of the multiple reentry vehicles just these shafts of light coming out of the sky where they're, where they're coming down. I'll have to try and dig that photo out and put it on the show notes. And that's because, you know, the, the speed that those things are re -entering. Um Again, I don't know if the math is absolutely correct, but I want to say that those warheads can reach speeds up to maybe Mach 15, Mach 20, give or take. Um, so, I mean, they are coming through. And, and even, you know, when you think about that too, Again, going back to the Cold War and how crazy things were and how crazy things got, when you even tried to create things that were, you know, anti-ballistic missile systems, well, it's really hard to do something with, with something that is moving at Mach 15 to Mach 20. I mean, what kind of defense are you going to have? So that's when things got, you know, really tricky. And and I, I, I go back to this crazy part about the Cold War, you know, and we talked about this before. But if people think about it during the entire period of the Cold War, OK, how much time, how much energy, how much effort and, and by gosh, how much money, not only us, but I mean, the Soviet Union, how much did we spend? And, you know, once we let the genie out of the bottle um, in Manhattan Project, I mean, the race was on. <laughs> And, you know, it's, well, if we've got five missiles, he's, he's got to have 10. Well, if he's got 10, well, then we need 30. Well, if he's got 30, I'm going to have 150. Well, and then the next thing, you know, uh, during this Cold War and when, when things were really hopping, we get up to these unbelievable amounts of, of nuclear weapons um, in, in all their forms. I, I don't know. At some point I heard some, I think we had uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 30,000 Warheads, give or take. And, you know, they've got them, too. Well, heaven, I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, if it ever came to it, and, and this is this part of the Cold War that, that's just really terrible. If there was a release, okay, I know what would be left behind 
to live with anymore. I mean, it would be so unbearably awful. It, it really would be horrific um, because you don't just have all that blast and that heat. And then you have the other a thing that's also incredibly problematic. You have all this radioactive material sitting there and, and you don't wash that away. I mean, it's just devastating. And, I, and sometimes, Ian, I always think to myself, I, I'm like, my gosh, how did we ever get here? You know, how did we get here? And again, I say these things and we'll get it also in, in more detail. I'm not a pacifist. I never have been and I never will be. However, when you understand from the inside, and that's why so many of these people, it, like your guests, that have this inside connection to this period of, of time in history called the Cold War and, and all its uh, nuances, a lot of them understood, I think, completely how awful things could be. Um, and that's why I say I, I'm, I'm such a fan of your podcast, because I think the stories, they need to be told and they need to be heard. Um, I just I do not believe that um, men, mankind, you know, should live under the umbrella of all these nuclear weapons. It's uh, I, I think it's just no way to live, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of comes back to, you know, when I was asking you about how you felt about launching uh, the missiles if you got the order through. I mean, if you did get the order through, then deterrence has broken down. And there's almost a question of, well, what's the point in launching these? Why why kill more people? Yeah, I mean, uh, and I have uh, sometimes I even wonder, you know, whether it was my colleagues or even sometimes I think I told you last time, I always wondered what people like me were doing around the world. And if it came to it, could could they do it? Um, or even whether it was guys in the Soviet Union. Um, I, I really honestly don't believe in, in my time that I ever encountered a person that if it came to it, that they would just freeze up, fold up, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. Um, I just don't have any doubts that people would have done it, you know, including me. But again, when you're talking about when putting those keys in there and it's the real deal and you're, you're about to turn them. You know, that stress and that trepidation, you know, like, my my gosh, are we really doing this? And my, my, my get off point is maybe that realization that, OK, now I know and I understand that diplomacy must have failed on every single possible level. And if I'm doing this, what that means is that they are inbound towards towards me and towards my. Tree. So. Yeah, it's just yeah, interesting. Kind of a conundrum, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If your colleague didn't turn the key, what what were you supposed to do if if they had decided not to turn it? I guess you, you just can't launch the missiles. You you just if if that were to happen, it would take he and I out of the equation. So like I mentioned before, you you have all these other sites with this connectivity. So if, if one person decided not to do it, it, it doesn't mean that they're not going. All these other sites can come in and because of all the connectivity and so forth, um, they can affect a launch in your absence. Right. So they can basically override the control and, and launch. OK. OK. And earlier you, you mentioned when you were doing the um, the the real launch test, your colleagues putting in targeting data. So I've got two questions here. One, did you know where your missiles were aimed at? On occasion, I think they would come to us and, and we had the opportunity to actually go into a secure you know, facility and they could show you, you know, tell you. Um, the whole time I was there, I, I, I did it once. And I remember after I did it, I was like, I probably should not have done that. <laughs> <laughs> because that's when it starts getting very, very personal. You don't want it to be personal because that's when you probably are going to increase your own level of difficulty in, in doing the job. Um, but I remember thinking at the time, I was like, oh, you know, wow. Okay, so that's where this one's going and that one's going. Okay. Hmm. And I never did it again. I said, that's it for me. I'm out. Uh, I don't want to know from here on out. So did you know the city that they were aimed at? Oh, yes. Sure. 
Wow. Can you tell me? No. No, that's, that's fine. I thought that was going to be the answer, but it's always worth asking, Tim. You never know. I can guess. I can guess what what they you know what 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 the targets uh, would would have been because I spoke to a uh, one of the crew of a Vulcan uh, nuclear bomber, the RAF V bomber, and he actually told me the target, and their target was uh, Tallinn in Estonia. So he was hitting. Okay, it was part of the Soviet Union then but it had been occupied by them in the 1940s. And obviously nowadays with the breakup of the Soviet Union, some of your targets would have been not necessarily your targets for your your silos, but the targets would have been Ukraine. They would have been places like Kiev and and others as well. Uh Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, you know. Now... The the other interesting conversation we had just uh, before we uh, ca- came came on to to do this recording is you had the opportunity to meet one of your opposite numbers who would have been launching missiles against the U.S. Tell me about that. Yeah, this one to me is very interesting, and this is one of those things that, uh, again, going back to my days as an officer in the Air Force, uh, you know, a younger fellow, I, I, for for a long part of my life, I, I was so, you know, anti communist anti-Russian, um, anti-Soviet Union, I never would have dreamt in a million years that I would ever, ever do something like this. But I did have the opportunity to go there. Uh, so you're talking about Ukraine, aren't you? That's right. Yep. Because obviously, you know, thank God, things changed. And now we are actually considered allies. Uh, but that was not the case when I first, you know, took my oath. I never thought my feet would set foot on any soil that had anything to do with the Soviet Union, uh, including Ukraine. But there I am. And um, so I go on to Google and I find this place. And sure enough, they've taken one of theirs and turned it into a museum. And so where I was, I knew I was in kind of, you know, close proximity and I thought, I'm, I'm not leaving this country and being this close to that place and not going. So I started kind of working through that and um, had a translator at the time. And I said, I, I don't care what it takes, but I, I need to get. Can you kind of work on that? And sure enough, you know, you know, next thing she says, yeah, absolutely. It's open and we're going on Thursday. So and so we go to this site. And, and to me, again, this is where things get a little bit maybe bizarre, kind of like people call it um, t- like Twilight Zone moments. So we're in the car and we're driving up to this site, okay? And we're on this gravel access road. And that's when I told him, I said, hey, just just stop the car for a second. And she was like, I don't understand. I mean, we're not there. It's it's up there. And I said, no, you don't understand. I just stopped the car. She stopped the car and I just absorbing everything. And I was like, my gosh, I'm literally, what came to my mind, again, the hands of time just, just went back. I was on the access road to Sierra 1 out in Torrington, Wyoming. It looked so similar. And then we go, we get on the site and um, we kind of break off and uh, we get a, we get a top side tour first. And then we're going to go down inside the uh, workings of, of the facility. Now, keep in mind, this is an old SS-24 site. And in that day, the SS-24, no, it's not as good as a peacekeeper, but this is a very formidable weapon system. Uh, 10 warheads do. I mean, this this one had us worried. So we we break off, and I have this translator, um, and she's going to be a tour guide. And there was another gentleman there, and I could tell he was a little bit older. Her name was Elena, and she spoke just really good English. And to her credit, even though she was not a former officer, she knew that place in detail. I mean, everything about that place, she knew. She was a great, great tour guide. So we split up. You know, they go their way and I go my mind because apparently this gentleman does not speak English. So it wouldn't work out with he and I too, too well to do a tour, you know. So we look at everything. and I'm, I'm snapping pictures in as fast as, as I can pull the shutter. Uh, taking video because we have a private group, you know, 400. Anyway, the Facebook and I want to capture this stuff and put it on the group for, for everybody to see. Um, at any rate, so we're done. Uh, we've gone downstairs. And, and the other thing that struck me, too, was when we got in there, 
it, it sounded, the, the sounds were the same. The smells were the same, you know, so it was bringing back all these memories like that. And then we come up topside and this is where the story I think got really interesting for me. So I, I, I don't remember how I broached the subject. I think I just asked the tour guide. I'm like, okay, who, so who is this gentleman? I mean, does he just work here at the museum and give tours? And she said, no, 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 no. <laughs> this gentleman was actually an officer. I mean, he was in the Ukrainian armed forces and this is what he used to do. So he's not a tour guide, and, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh. And that's when I started connecting the dots. This guy basically did what I did. Uh, so I was over in Cheyenne, Wyoming doing, you know, my duty and he was there doing his duty. Um, his name, see if I can recall it and, and pronounce it cor- correctly. And if Victor, if I don't, don't hold it against me. Uh, Victor Nikolaevich Kazintsov. Uh, He retired as a major, but he was on active duty. I think I understand roughly 1980 to 2001. And so we had the opportunity to start, uh, I mean, as much as we can do it and we don't have much time, but I got the translator and we kind of started going back and forth on just a couple of little things with each other. And then at the end, which is, uh, you know, one of those pictures I, I, I showed you, which to me is, is priceless and very precious to me. Uh, we're arm in arm, you know, my arms over his shoulder and, you know, it took a photograph and I thought, man, this is, this is just the way it should have been all, all along, to be honest. Uh, but after that encounter, I just felt to myself, you know, if, if things were different, this guy and I, we, we could have been fishing buddies. They're not different, not so different from us. And some of the interesting things that the tour guide, Elena, mentioned to me, uh, she said that, you know, like these guys and they have these dreams still. And I thought, my gosh, it, it's it's the same. I mean, now and then I still have some of those dreams about that stuff. And I think that through our little conversation, I kind of sensed and felt that he was probably similar to me. I I, I don't have any doubts that he probably would have done the job, but I sensed that it's not something that he was looking forward to doing. Now I could be wrong, but that was my sense just in, in the short time that I had to, you know, spend with him, which is just not much time at all. Incredible encounter. Um, And then when we were through, I remember asking the tour guide, you know, do you recall any other black American that did what I did, you know, coming over here and she's, and they were, they said, no, I don't know if there have been or not, but, um, that was pretty interesting too. So for me, it, it kind of brought the human connection really in focus for me. And just that feeling of, okay, I'm standing here next to this guy and boy, 30 years ago, things were very, very different. Um, we were, we were not friends and would not have been friends, but now I, you know, somebody like him, gosh, I would just, you know, of course I, if I lived over there, I'd I'd love to get to know him. That's an incredible opportunity there to meet somebody who was over the hill doing exactly the same role as you. I mean, what sort of questions did you, did you ask him through the interpreter? I honestly don't really remember other than very basic things. Um, So I couldn't go back and and elaborate on the details of uh, more than I've already alluded to. Mm. I even got, uh, I remember he was sitting there, I think at a a desk in a chair and I could see these like coffee mugs and I thought, ah, that's interesting. And it looked to me like maybe they sell these things or something, but it's, it's a coffee mug with a picture of this uh, museum and the missile that's sitting up on top. And, um, I either asked the translator or asked him through the translator, I think, you know, if I could get more things. And, but sure enough, I did. I I took one home. I've got it in my cabinet right now. Uh, so every time, you know, every now and then I'll pour the cup of coffee and I, I remember my time, remember my encounter meeting Victor. Wow. Wow. And how did the um, command post fit as far as, uh, you know, how, how your one was? You know, how, how similar was it? Uh, eerily familiar, eerily similar. Um, it's like, wow, these, uh, <laughs> it's not terribly different. But um, our service elevator was bigger 
uh, theirs was a lot more claustrophobic. Man, it was a tight fit in there. Uh, so going down in that thing uh, was a little interesting. But when you got into it, um, wasn't too much different. You know, it was also suspended on on shock isolators. I recall it seemed like theirs may have been a little bit deeper, but uh, the soles were were set a little bit different. So in, in ours, and you can see in the picture, you basically have one guy on one end of the capsule, if you want to call it that. And you got another guy kind of like midsection of, of the uh, capsule in those two red chairs. Now, their chairs, um, they were almost one behind the other. Um, but phones, switches, the display panels, uh, a lot of it was 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 fairly similar. And, you know, they had a we did a, actually did a launch sequence in there. They actually had that, that site powered up and you could do a simulated launch in, in, in the museum in, in Ukraine. Did you did you do that? Did you turn the key or not? No, we had a, we had a funny time with this because when she said, "Hey, you can sit in the chair and you can you know we can do this launch," and I was like, "Well, let me, man, I've I've been there and done it. I've done it a thousand times. I said, let's let's let the translator and the driver let's let them have some fun here, you know." Yeah. So they did it, and all the bells and whistles off went off, and you know that's when I started kind of snickering about, well, you just kind of destroyed my house and my dog and you know, cat and whatever. So we had a little bit of a giggle about that, but that that was fun. And also, I think another kind of very personal side of this story in regards to my time in Ukraine. Again, I never thought in a million years I would ever go there and uh, meet my wife, Marina. Um, or, you know, meet some other gentlemen, um, guys like Eager and Alex, who, you, you know, sit around a table and talk to them. It just such an enjoyable time. So it was a, a pleasure of mine to get to know them. And, and again, sometimes if you turn the hands of time back, you know, 30 years ago, uh, you, you would think to yourself, there is no way something like that would ever happen, nor would it be possible. But you just never know. And here we are. To me, it's a reminder, and it's a reminder simply it should have been like this all along. It should have. But unfortunately, we've got this piece in our history, um, this Cold War mess, and then, uh, of course, we still have what's happening over there now, and it's just unpleasant. Yeah. I mean, just going back to your career with um, with Peacekeeper, are there any sort of incidents that stand out? for you that we've not spoken about already yeah this this is what i mean it's comical you know but it happened in the court about a nanosecond okay but again you have to and this this was not in the simulator this was out at, at one of the sites in real time on a real alert uh, we had done a crew changeover and i believe i was sitting on the bed doing something and again 50 million to one odds um and and over the nanosecond this this kind of happened. I happened to turn my head and look forward to the to the commander's console, and on one of those vertical displays, that light to me at the bottom that said "missile away" it appeared to be illuminated. Now you can imagine for a nanosecond, um, I thought I was going to literally levitate off the bed because if that light is lit, the indication is that the missile is away, or something has has happened. And it's like, oh, my God, the repercussions, what in the world is going on here? And again, you, you compress this into a nanosecond. And in the space of that little short time, you know, adrenaline and, and the heart rate just shot through the roof. And like I said, I felt like I was going to come off the bed, just scared the living, you know, what out of me. Um, yeah. But then, of course, a second later, I realized, oh, my gosh, OK. Whew. Yeah. Wow. Just a freak occurrence. No, that was about it. We, we, I think once we got to the point of the peacekeeper, the way things were built, the R and D, the technology, things were so good that, I mean, we just didn't have anything go wrong. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't always that way. You know that as well as anybody, but you know, back in the early days of the cold war, when us and the Soviet union, you know, we started making these things and, and trying to get them out. And, you know, we go back to Atlas for us and, I mean, if you see some of the video from those days, it was almost comical. It's like, oh, my gosh. Right, if we had 50 of these, how many are we actually going to be able to get over there? Um, it, it, kind of that kind of stuff, you know, as we figured things out. And then it, so and they were so dangerous, you know, even the guys that had to maintain them because you had all these hazardous agents 
um, whether it be, you know, fuel or oxidizer. I mean, this stuff can kill you. And thank goodness through the evolution, these systems, especially like Minute Maid Peacekeeper, got much, much, much safer. If you look back, what would you say was the best thing about life as a missileer? You know, for the first time in your life, okay, you're, you're, you're out of college, you're an officer, you're actively employed, and you're off, you know, halfway across the country. And this is kind of your first job. And it's your first opportunity whereby you have to, you know, you're interacting with other people similar to you in age. And man, you get to meet people from every walk of life and from every part of the United States. And to me, that was a very neat thing. I felt like, and, uh, and because of the job we did and, and what we did together, you develop just kind of some close bonds or friendships. And, you know, at times it felt like almost like this glorified fraternity. Uh, we, I mean, we were pretty close. I mean, who else did you have? I mean, we had each other, you know, um, doing the same job, understanding what it is you're doing, you know, you, you know, all those things and you can relate to one another. And again, most of us were fresh college. And um, so that was a very neat, interesting part of that. The other part was me being the outdoorsman um, in Wyoming. I mean, are, are you kidding? Uh, you talk about beautiful space. And I was a hunter, avid hunter. And so I would go hunting. And again, you know, as a missile guy, you would do your alerts and you would, you would have like a lot of time. We call it downtime or, or free time. So you can do what you want. You want to go hunting, go hunting. You want to go skiing, go skiing. Um, you want to get into a hobby or something like that. And not a problem. So as you probably guess, my second question is what is the worst thing about being a missile? <laughs> Man, I, I would have to say sometimes the, the, the sheer boredom the monotony, uh, being down there, um, kind of that mental grind of it. It's just like, Oh my God, you know, 24 hours of this kind of thing, not knowing what to expect, but especially those times when nothing was going on. I mean, it was dead silent. The only thing you could hear was just the hum of the, uh, electric generator. I mean, that's spinning and, and pushing the air conditioning through those units. And that was about it. You didn't have a TV down there or anything like that? Uh, the, yes, there was a television, but we didn't have like, you know, cable television or satellite TV. You had VHS tapes. So it was kind of a, mo a monitor, basically. So, you know, you had your VHS tapes and you could, you know, watch a movie or something like that. As you progressed through your working life, did, did many people know the role that you'd had or, or not? No. No, I, I, I think for a long, a long time, I, I didn't really talk about that very much. Um, and I guess for a couple of reasons, number one, where I went to this earlier, when I left and I, I put Cheyenne in my rear view mirror, I basically just kind of swept that into a closet and said that part of my life, it's, it's over and done with. And, and, you know, I'm finished. Uh, it's not that, okay, I'm not proud of it, but, um, it's done. That was a chapter and it's over. And the other part is I really didn't think that there would be too many people that I could sit down and as badly as I want to talk about it or wanted to talk to some people about it, I didn't know how it was going to be received. I mean, okay, I, you're telling me this and number one, I don't understand anything you're talking about or, you know, that's some stuff that I really don't even care to discuss, uh, you know, that thing. But then, you know, as I guess as I got older and older and older, just something just kind of started welling up. It's like, I, I really, I kind of want to talk about this um, and share something with somebody. So that's kind of in a way how I stung your, uh, your podcast. Um, I, I didn't know who you were and I didn't even know that there was a cold War conversations podcast until I kind of started investigating something and somebody put me, um, you know, in, in you give me your contact information and that's that's how it all started yeah i think it was david at the cold war channel on uh youtube who put me or put you in contact with me and uh i'm very grateful for him for that and if anybody's um or if people have not seen the channel just look look for cold war channel or cold war tv i think it is on youtube 
and uh, they've got a fantastic archive of uh, documentary episodes about various aspects of of the Cold War. And they also, David also exhibits a very nice Cold War conversations coaster in front of him on every episode. So I'm immensely grateful for the uh, publicity uh, there. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.